normal sized hands, not like me, this is going to be a really good sized phone. For those who have small hands like I do, this is actually perfect. I've been so incredibly happy with this phone. Finally, I have a phone that's powerful that fits my hand that's not an iPhone. The important thing is to be able to reach the fingerprint sensor or the imprint sensor comfortably, and I just really can't do that so well on the XL. So if I want to swipe it, I'm kind of stressing my finger there where this is perfect. So size does matter here, and my favorite has been the smaller one. Now you probably noticed that between now and my unboxing that I had the silver phone, and now this is the black one, and I actually traded it in for this one. The black one looks a lot cleaner and a lot nicer to me. Also, this chin here at the bottom isn't as obvious on both of these as it is on the white model of the phone. Although I think that Google did a pretty good job, even with the white one, not making the front look so busy with sensors. So speaking of this chin here at the bottom, let's get this out of the way in the very, very beginning. I don't have any trouble with this chin whatsoever, and here's why. Phone displays are getting larger and larger, and bezels are getting slimmer and slimmer to where there's nothing to hold on to anymore to where you're not touching the display. If there isn't good palm rejection, then you accidentally touch parts on the display. So with this phone, I feel like there's actually a part to grab onto, and that actually really helps when watching media, for example, because I'm not blocking the speaker. So I can hold this, listen to media, no speaker blockage, plus the most obvious thing that appealed to me when I was out taking pictures was that I actually have something to grip when I am framing my shots. So this works quite nicely. A lot of people make fun of this chin, but for me, it's kind of, oh, hello, I'm happy to see you again. This may not be a design for everybody because it looks like there's just a lot of dead space, but it's practical for some people. Now let's move on to taking a look at the back here before we give a nice tour of the phone. You can see that there is this glass window. This is here for a reason. It's supposed to help with reception. Also, it looks like it's kind of an art statement design piece in a way. But from what I am seeing, this glass may not be as strong as the glass on the front. It seems to scratch pretty easily. That's what I've noticed. I have quite a few scratches, and it's really hard to tell in this environment. But in direct sunlight, for example, I've got scratches everywhere, littered entirely, where the body doesn't seem to have any scratches at all. So get yourself a case. If you hate cases, which I mostly do, get yourself a skin or something. It'll also protect it from cracking. That's another thing. I'm seeing that people are cracking this pretty easily, even tech racks. He was just trying to take a picture of his phone or whatever. It fell down and immediately it cracked. So this can crack fairly easily. So protect this. Keep this in mind. Also, the camera is right underneath this glass and I have a scratch that's passing just, just barely missing where the lens is. And I'm worried that over time I might see the scratches if they're deep enough. Maybe there'll be weird reflections. So this has me paranoid a little bit. I have been using this entirely caseless though, and just as long as I put it down on the table nice and slowly, and I'm gentle with it and not raking it across the table, it's generally been okay. Expect scratches, but I really am going to look into getting myself a skin. So now I'd like to take a second to thank my sponsors at Braintree so much for making content creation possible. Braintree is code for easy mobile payments, and they're basically a major reason that you can press one button and pay for something. Maybe you're working on the next Uber, Airbnb, or GitHub. Then why not use the same simple payment solution that helped them become what they are today? Braintree's full stack payment platform is easily adaptable to whatever the future holds so that you can adapt easily too. Accept nearly any type of payment from Apple Pay to Bitcoin, Venmo, credit cards, or whatever types of payment that comes next with just a few lines of code. This all means that the platform is stress-free, simple, and adaptable for mobile app developers. And they offer a single integration across all platforms with superior fraud protection, customer service, and fast payouts. See fewer abandoned carts and more sales with Braintree's best-in-class mobile checkout experience. That way you'll always be ready whether you're earning your first dollar or your billionth. Check it out at braintreepayments.com slash Erica to learn more. Now for the grand tour around the phone. Both of these are exactly the same. Just a size difference. 5 inch display versus 5.5 inches. 
although there is a difference in resolution and we are going to talk about that in the display section. So starting off with the front, we have an 8 megapixel camera, you have the receiver, you also have the ambient light sensor and proximity sensor right here. And an interesting thing is that a lot of people are saying that there is no notification LED anywhere to be found. Actually, yes, there is. It's underneath the speaker grill. Just go underneath settings, then notifications, then hit this little non-obvious wheel here, and you're presented with pulse notification light. And voila, we now have a notification LED. I find it strange though that even when I have it plugged in, that it's not showing me a little red light to indicate that it's charging. Maybe it's just for notifications. Let me know your experience, you guys. I bet you this is not enabled by default because of ambient display, which will wake your screen when you receive notifications. Maybe that seemed redundant and less clean to them, but it definitely is there hidden for your consideration. So moving on, we have the chins here at the bottom that don't seem to have any function except for their good grip. Then on the left hand side you have the SIM card tray. It takes a nano SIM. No SD card slot on this phone, although you do have 128 gigabyte and 32 gigabyte storage options. I'm really thrilled that there is 128 gigabyte, but these things are expensive. Talking about iPhone expensive, even matching the price. Then on the right hand side we have the power button. You've also got your volume rocker. You can see that we've got these antenna band lines here and here, which also helps with reception with the glass here. So on the back, you can see that we have this glass, and on this glass section, we have the imprint fingerprint sensor, both of these in the same place. You've got a dual LED flash. We have a 12.3 megapixel camera. We've also got a microphone and laser assist autofocus. You can see that's what this is for here. NFC is under here. And you've got this really nice matte feeling aluminum on both of these. There was a slight difference in feel to me between the silver and the black one. I actually prefer the black one better. It's a little bit rougher, maybe less slippery to me. Now I have seen the very blue one and it looks really, really nice. It's just, I'm not a fan of that. I'd probably be a bigger fan if there was a 128 gigabyte option, but it's a special edition capped at 32 gigabytes. That's really unfortunate. Here's another band here at the bottom for reception. G to indicate Google Phone, although this has been manufactured by HTC, designed by Google though. Then at the bottoms, we have a speaker. You've got the microphone and the USB-C charging port. Now, no, this does not have stereo speakers, but I am seeing some mods on XDA done where you have the speaker here. And just like with the iPhone 7s, They've been able to get the receiver to function as a speaker too. Maybe not as powerful as the bottom, but that's interesting. So if you are somebody who likes to mod, you can go and play around with that. I'll put a link down in the description so you can check that out. Finally, at the top, we've got the headphone jack. So for those of you who really value having a headphone jack, that is there. Otherwise, taking a look around the rest of the phone, you can see this tapered looking design, thinner here at the bottom, a bit thicker here at the top so that they could fit the camera supposedly without having it protrude. I do like the design of this, though it is nothing remarkable. I like how it's flat and then it's rounded. I think it feels really nice in the hand to me. So what is my overall outstanding statement on the design? Well, the Pixel, the smaller one, is just a Pixel XL miniaturized very very smudgy too but ultimately newish looking but also very very familiar because of the iphones and people may or may not like this glass window but seriously just cover it with the skin and you'll never have to see it again now let's move on to talking about the user experience of this phone and just how it feels to use this i know a lot of people came from the galaxy note 7 and that phone had so many features that was really neat that was probably my favorite phone of the year it is no more so people now are trying to find what to do now what phone to get now and on paper a lot of people are not so pleased with this phone because it looks like it's kind of ho-hum there's not too much to it but let me tell you the experience on this phone is phenomenal a lot better than what i expected i didn't care for this phone on paper at all but now that I've been using this for several weeks, it has started to fill that hole in my heart that the Galaxy Note 7 left. So this is like that nice, quick little sports car where the Galaxy Note 7 was the Mack truck. It's hard to say which one is better. They each had their own special things. This is just an awesome, quick, no-nonsense experience that does what it does very well. 
So I love the user experience. I love the interface. I didn't think I was going to care for the Pixel Launcher because I played with it on the Nexus 6P and just didn't like this pull tab thing until I learned that actually you can swipe from anywhere. Doesn't have to be right from the side or anything, although it wasn't like that before anyways. And I really adore the new app tray. I like being able to pull up from pretty much anywhere around the bottom. Then I can just simply swipe back down again. So I think that this lends really nicely to one-handed use. To me, this has been just excellent. When looking at the user interface, I think that the one thing that's missing is a dark mode. You see, when you pull upward, this is white. When you pull downward from the notification shade and the toggle shade, this is a dark gray. But there is no option to change the whole user interface to being black. And black would really complement the UI with those nice inky blacks. So that's something I really think would be a boon for this phone. I think it would really look quite nice with the dark model of the phone too. I can hope. So simple, uncomplicated, and this is a very, very snappy user interface. The Pixel Launcher, oh my goodness, it just flies. Let's go down here to Developer Options, and let's find Profile GPU Rendering and On Screen as Bars. So let's scroll up from right here and just scroll through the App menu. And these little peaks here, whenever they go over this green bar, indicate a drop frame or several drop frames depending on how high it is. You can just see how smooth it is. Sometimes you'll get some drop frames, but mostly when scrolling through the interface, this thing is so nice and smooth. It just feels so super responsive and that really helps the experience. It's not incredibly janky like some phones that you're used to. I went into an AT&T store and the manager had a chance to play with my Pixel and was just like, whoa, when seeing the difference between something like the Galaxy S7 and the Pixel. A lot, lot smoother. So Google has done a really good job. Looking at the meat of the launcher a little bit more, you've got this pull bar here, which is going to bring you to Google now, but also if you tap on this, it's going to bring you into search. So now that's very discreet. I like that. It gives the illusion that there's more room. I hoped I could get an extra icon here at the top, but it looks like this here is fixed in place. So you can't get rid of this. And if you do want to go back to the old launcher, if you go underneath the Play Store, that's really not going to help you. It's going to tell you your device isn't compatible with this version, but really no matter, just go online and find yourself an older APK, download that, install it, and it works. See, there it is. I was able to install it, no trouble. It's just not going to be something that's compatible from the Play Store. I prefer the Pixel one though now after using this. I just love this app tray from the bottom. So just like from before, if you hold downward, it's going to bring up some options. You've got wallpapers, widgets, and your settings. Going underneath settings, you have options for app suggestions. Show Google app, which is Google now. And allow home screen rotation. I keep that off. It gets quite annoying after a while. But it allows you essentially to rotate the interface no matter where you are. I suppose that could be good for the bigger phone. This is something I find more beneficial on a tablet, though. Widgets is the same as usual. Then you have wallpapers, and this is pretty cool. I use my own wallpaper. This is Paperland Pro. I recommend this. Seriously, it's really, really neat. But Live Earth wallpapers have been really pretty nice. I'm sure you guys have seen these all by now, but it just gives a live feeling to the wallpapers. This is Yosemite National Park. Let's go ahead and set the wallpaper. And unless you've got a lot of tabs, there really isn't a lot of movement, this really nice 3D looking movement. But as soon as you unlock it, it does give you that nice smooth movement. So whenever I have this live earth wallpaper thing on, I'm constantly turning off my phone and turning it back on just to watch that really neat animation. Let's do it again. Oh yeah. Just one more time. That never gets old. Now they've only got several here. I really hope that they continue to release more because I get bored after a while. And that's where I end up going back to my Paperland Pro because it's very dynamic. Right now it matches with the season. Seriously, try this out. This is not an ad. 
Also, what's really nice is just being able to touch down for a moment. It's going to give you some shortcuts. This is so iPhone-like. And just like with Force Touch on the iPhone or 3D Touch or whatever the heck you call it, I don't really use this. I haven't used it really at all. But on some things, it looks like it would be quite useful. Maybe I'll have more interest when there's more support for third-party apps. You can see that all this did was just pull this over as a shortcut. Eh, I'll wait. Now, of course, like before, you can double press on that power button to execute the camera, although it's been kind of finicky, I've noticed. It doesn't always want to work for me. Something else that's been kind of finicky is the Google Assistant. When I say, OK, Google, half the time it'll execute and turn on and actually unlock. But other times, it just completely ignores me. I don't know what its problem is, or maybe it'll wake the phone, but it won't actually unlock it. Okay, Google. Like, right now. Why is it doing that? Okay, Google. Okay, Google. Darn you, Google, why are you ignoring me? She has a mind of her own. Okay, Google. And then it tells me something like, couldn't recognize your voice. Unlock without okay, Google. I'm infuriated. I've had to reprogram my voice a couple times. I try saying things a similar way, but it's just not so reliable right now. I'm hoping it's just a bug. I'm sure Google can fix it, but let me know your experience. Some people say it works all the time, 99%, and then there's other people in the camp like me where I'm very infuriated with this function. Okay, Google. Okay, Google. No, screw you, Google. I'm tired of you. So the neat thing here with Google Assistant is that it's able to do a lot of things, one of which is being able to understand context-specific questions. So I asked it what a chihuahua was. It gave me some quick info. And then I was able to carry on the conversation. How big are they? And here you have the height. Then how much do they weigh? And you have the weight. Then I said, can you show me some animal shelters to get one? And it gave me the top search results. So it can work quite well, but on other things it can be a little bit unintelligent. But the more you use it, and the more people use it in general, it's supposed to get more intelligent. So it's new right now. Just hang in there. Don't insult the phone. I already tried doing that just now. And she said, I'm still learning. What can I help you with? That kind of broke my heart. Kind of being a bully to the phone. I'm actually feeling a little bad. So she's actually quite witty, too. Okay, Google. Make me a sandwich. Poof, you're a sandwich. Thanks, Google. That's really funny. Tell me a joke. How did the vacuum cleaner die? It bit the dust. Ha 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 ha. She can also play games with you. Sure, just tap the kind you want. So I don't know if this is supposed to be endearing or just a little bit sad that if you don't have human interaction during the day, Google can sit and have a conversation with you. I'm feeling sad. Yes! So, oh, cute. Very cute. So moving right along with other features of the phone, on the back you've got the Pixel imprint sensor. So on top of it being able to unlock your phone, and it's pretty accurate as long as you keep it clean. I've noticed sometimes when it gets a little bit grimy with fingerprints, it tells me that it can't recognize. So keep that in mind. But otherwise, I find it really nice that you can swipe your finger downward, and it's going to allow you to view the notification shade. And I use this all the time, all the time, constantly. It's so important to me that I want the smaller version of the phone so that it's easier for me to do this. Otherwise, it's not such a joy. I am a little bit sad, though, that it doesn't do more than just simply showing your notifications. I wish that if you held down on it, that it would dismiss your notifications. So it doesn't do that. That's something I've seen with Huawei phones. Also, it'd be nice if I could scroll through the interface. So if I wanted to scroll downward, once underneath a list or something, or once underneath the Chrome browser, it would be really nice to, to use that, like I've seen before. So that's just a wish of mine. It's really nice to see this, but I would like more features. So that's kind of Huawei-like. Another thing that seems similar to other phones I've seen is the flick of the camera to bring to the front-facing camera. Hello! That's like Motorola-type phones. You've also got double touch to switch between your two recent applications. I'm hearing that's like Cyanogen. Then last but not least, you've got the multi-window type function, 
or if you go underneath an app that's supported, if you hold down, you can see that it's giving you options of what you can use. So let's just say eBay. And there you are. So you can move around the window, you can change its size. If you move all the way downward, it's going to make this full size. If you've got two open and you exit out of it, it's going to remember it and keep it here for you. So when you press again, there you are. And when not in split screen mode, you can hold down an app that's capable of it, drag it upward, and it's going to execute this split screen mode as well. Looks very much like Samsung, doesn't it? Also, let's not forget unlimited backup for pictures that are on the phone. So you have unlimited full resolution photos and videos uploaded from the Pixel. Now this does not count for Google Drive. It doesn't apply to anything else but photos and videos that are on the phone that you're uploading. From what I'm seeing, this also applies to my other folders, such as my download folders and my screenshot folders. If I'm wrong, please correct me, but it looks like none of that is counting towards my limited space. If this is true, I'm sure people will catch on eventually and start abusing the system, which makes me wonder how long Google is going to support this unlimited upload from the phone. Now, a neat thing that I found when going through the settings is free up device storage. So this comes in 32 gigabytes and 128 gigabyte configurations. And if you have a 32 gigabyte configuration, you're taking a lot of 4K videos, for example, you've got a lot of pictures, you'll probably be okay with a 32 gigabyte version of the phone as long as you're using free up device storage. So when you click on this, it's going to find all those photos and everything that I have and the ones that are backed up already if I hit remove, it will remove them off the storage of the phone, but they'll still be backed up onto the cloud. So you have all that room still for all of your applications. It clears up room for more videos and pictures, but these are backed up in their original quality. So that's a really nice thing. And it's really nice to help free up some space. So that's brilliant that that's made right there for you. And the last thing that it can do, if you go underneath settings here, you see that there is a tab for support. They have a whole tab dedicated to this. We're here for you 24 seven. So you're able to call them or chat with them and have support right away. I actually used this the other day because the phone I told you that I returned in order to get this one, USPS lost it. We don't know where it is, but Google's going to give me a refund anyway. I tell you, I have so many problems with shipping and it's not my fault ever. So this works right now. I'm hoping that it always works because this is the most seamless and easy experience I've had with customer service on a phone ever. Now moving on to talking about specs and performance, we have the Snapdragon 821 SoC inside of this. Now this is not the higher clocked 821 SoC. This one is actually at the same frequency as the S820 right now. 2.15 gigahertz for the two higher powered cores. We've got the Adreno 530 GPU, four gigabytes of RAM. The internal specs of these phones are exactly the same, except for battery size and of course the display resolution. Now I want to remark that I don't have my normal suite of benchmarks because a lot of the benchmarks actually do not work yet for this version of NuGet. But I can tell you what I have observed with this phone and this is a great phone. It's not a janky piece of crap like I've seen with a lot of Android phones. Day-to-day -day performance is absolutely awesome. We've got Geekbench 4 right here. And really in general with CPU, it's very, very similar to other flagship Android phones with the S820. Really, there isn't a performance difference with this 821 SoC because that frequency is still the same, but it is more power efficient. So both the Pixel and the Pixel XL CPU-wise look the same here. Here we have the LG V20. It's also, they're all very similar. I find GPU performance to be similar to other top-rated Android phones as well. But I actually do see a difference between the smaller phone and the larger phone simply because there's a difference in resolution. You have a lower resolution phone, meaning there's less pixels that have to be pushed around. So for the on-screen tests for car chase, you can see that it says 20 frames per second versus 11 frames per second. Looking at Manhattan, you have 33 frames per second versus 16, so on and so forth. Yet, by the time you get down to the bottom, you've got 58 frames per second versus 53. So as the intensity of the test goes down, eh, they're somewhat similar. So of course, I say that there's a slight leap in performance with a lower resolution version. But in general, everyday tasks and in non-intensive games, both of them should perform about the same. On both of these, I have been pretty impressed with their sustained performance. So just performance over time. I don't see really 
any throttling to really speak of. So throttling really hasn't been too much of an issue. I see the same thing on the CPU side. These phones sustain performance pretty darn well. If you're really taxing the heck out of this thing, it can get really quite warm. Expect that with these metal phones. But this is a great performer. It really is. Sustained or just doing small burst tasks. So this is all needless to say that I've been playing games without a hitch. I really haven't had any complaints about performance whatsoever. But if you have, let me know what those complaints have been in the comment section below. I've been a happy camper. Now for app launching speed and app switching speed, I'd normally use Disco Mark, but like I was saying, with my normal suite of benchmarks, I haven't really been able to use those because not everything works right now. But this launches apps very nice and quickly. The app switching feature you can see here is so smooth and so fast. There's really no hiccups and it doesn't miss a beat. So whether you are switching between your applications or you're executing and getting into an application, this thing is great. So this phone may be fast at opening apps and also switching between apps, but in terms of keeping them open, how does it perform? I would normally use Disco Mark, but that's not working properly. But I've got 12 different applications open here that I would practically use, and actually more than I would practically use, several of which are games. And it's able to keep all of them in RAM without any problem whatsoever. We've got Riptide, GB2, that's pretty intensive. Just a couple of games. I love Evo Explorers, that's a great one. Nothing has been shutting down. I haven't had any issues whatsoever. You should let me know your experience with this. For me, the RAM management has been just fine. Quick to open apps, quick to switch between them, and also keeps them open. To me, that is a perfect ratio of performance. So let's move on to talking about these displays. At first glance, these are beautiful displays. These are AMOLED displays. The resolution of the 5-inch one is 1080p. And then you've got Quad HD on the 5.5-inch display. So if you're somebody who's going to be getting all into Google Daydream, get the Pixel XL. It's really not that much bigger than the regular size Pixel, but the pixel density is far greater. It's over 500 pixels per inch. I think it's about 515 or so, where this is about 441. I will correct myself if I am wrong, but when holding this up close to your face when doing Google Daydream, it's going to look a lot less pixelated to you. Otherwise, 441 pixels per inch has been a really good pixel density and in everyday use, holding it at a decent distance from my face. I have not had any objections whatsoever to this resolution. I think that 1080p at this size is a good compromise, so no complaints there. But if you're somebody who really wants the best of the best, then get the Pixel XL. For me, it's just been a matter of size. Now I'm going to measure both of these displays and talk about them, but I do want to talk about display quality at first. With AMOLED displays, so much of the time it is a lottery. You don't know if you're going to get a nice uniform display. Oftentimes when looking at grays or whites, you'll have a two-tonedness, where part of the display will be a neutral looking tone and another part will be kind of pinkish or greenish or something. And I'm noticing that with both of these phones as well. I've actually seen several different displays now of the Pixel, and all of them seem to have some type of uniformity issue, although the best that I have right now is this one. So if you have a display that's not very uniform to your liking, just go and exchange it, but realize that there's a very good chance that you'll find another one that has a uniformity issue. That just seems to be something with AMOLED. Very difficult to fabricate these and get them to be nice and uniform. I have had several people complain to me though that there's other things they're seeing with the Pixel display. Not all of them are like this, okay? So keep that in mind. Just go and exchange your display if you don't like it. But I've been seeing weird grayish lines and other interesting anomalies on my Pixel XL display. They're not all going to be like this, but I've heard more than one person tell me that they've seen it. So it seems that maybe this isn't Samsung's top quality display. As far as I know, these are being manufactured by Samsung. So with my Pixel XL, I have hit the jackpot with uniformity issues. Weird greens in places and weird lines and just doesn't look so nice. Just go and exchange it. Don't settle for less, but realize AMOLED is a lottery. Now my biggest concern with AMOLED displays when they're using this on-screen touch bar is image retention, but worse, burn-in. So when this bar here is shown for a little bit of time, I do see that the image is retained. 
it tends to fade a bit over time, but also I notice what doesn't fade over time is there pretty much indefinitely. So I'm already seeing it's having just a tiny, teeny bit of burn in. And of course, that nice bit of ghosting slash image retention, it should fade in a little bit. So if you're not wanting to compromise with having to deal with burn in, then probably don't get this phone, get something like a Samsung Galaxy phone where even though it's an AMOLED display, there are hardware buttons, or even the OnePlus 3, where you can change between on-display keys and hardware buttons. So Google, I really wish you would have done that. You've got all this room down here at the bottom, and it's nice to hold on to it, but at the very least, you could have put some type of a hardware key, or at least capacitive keys. So far, though, when watching videos or playing games, whenever I look at this side in the corner, I'm not seeing those on-screen buttons. They're not showing up just yet. But I expect that probably over time, if they have a chance to burn in enough, I will see a little circle and square and triangle. If you're planning on keeping this phone and using it heavily for a year or two, then that might end up being a problem. So this is just something I want to call attention to. Currently, I only really see it against dark grays, and that's only because I've been really looking for it. But just preparing you all. If you want to salvage your display, you do have some options. You can use GMD Immersive Mode. So that's essentially going to hide all the software buttons. And those software buttons should really only appear here when you swipe up and try to get to them. But otherwise, you can see that they hide. Now, as for display calibration between these two, they're fairly similar, although their white points are a little bit different, or how the whites look. You do have two separate modes. Underneath developer options, you can see that we have an sRGB mode, so that's going to make colors not look saturated, where you've got the standard mode, which is going to make everything look nice and punchy. I'm sure that most people are going to be using this mode. In comparison, the sRGB mode is going to look pretty lifeless. Another reason that I think that the sRGB mode is not looking so nice is grayscale issues and also white point issues. If you don't have a nice balance between red, green, and blue, it's going to make a weird color cast on all the colors, so that applies for both of these. Actually, the white point and even the grayscale ends up looking a bit nicer on just the oversaturated mode, so I end up <laughs> using the oversaturated mode more just because I can't stand the way that colors look because of that weird color cast on the sRGB modes. Mostly people aren't going to notice anything and it's going to look really nice and beautiful and saturated. But if you don't like oversaturated colors, you can choose the sRGB mode. It just looks a little weird. So my overall conclusion with these displays is that they are beautiful. They both look quite nice. They are very, very similar. But expect to have a lottery with these displays. I don't think that these are Samsung's top of the line displays. They probably reserve those for their own phones. But I do believe that these are current generation AMOLED displays and they are pretty darn good. They don't even have an issue with turning pinkish when you turn down the brightness all the way. So that is a definite plus. Okay, so now let's move on to talking about the battery life of both of these devices. We have the Pixel XL with a 3450 milliamp hour battery. Not a bad size battery. And then we have the much smaller Pixel with the 2770 milliamp hour battery. That's quite a bit smaller. Now keep in mind that we do have a smaller 5-inch display and also a 1080p display versus the larger 5.5-inch display of the Pixel XL and also we've got quite HD resolution. So considering that and then also in my actual usage, I've been pretty happy to see that I'm able to get at least 4.5 to 5 hours of on-screen time. I'm mostly on Wi-Fi during the day. I keep my brightness at about half. I do a lot of mobile office things such as checking my email, composing things. Then I do get my YouTube videos in there. I like to watch some Netflix. I also will play a game or two. I also like to take pictures here and there. So this is getting quite a bit of usage during the day and I'm getting 4.5 to 5 hours of average on-screen time. I'm pretty darn happy. So I'm seeing that people are saying that they're getting an average of 5 to 7 hours of on-screen time for the XL. So if you're someone who needs to have a little bit more battery during the day, a little bit more leeway, get the XL. But for me, this has actually been just fine. Now talking a bit about their charging speeds, we have USB Type-C at the bottom. Both should charge pretty quickly. The Pixel XL supports up to 18 watts and the Pixel supports only 15. 
previously. There was a mistake on Google's documentation on their website, and it said that the Pixel also charged at peak of 18 watts, but no, it's 15. But if you take into consideration that that is the peak charging speed, that means it's only going to be charging at 18 watts for a small amount of time, and that only happens in the beginning, and then it starts to slow down towards the end. Plus, this has a smaller battery. So when you take 18 versus 15 into consideration, that's not too huge. And honestly, they're probably going to charge up at about the same rate. So I'm not so upset about that. Supposedly, they had to do with thermal constraints. This is a smaller phone. So let me know if that is something that has upset you or not. For me, I don't care. This does charge up pretty quickly, and it has pretty darn good battery life for being such a tiny phone. Now a bit about connectivity, the thing that makes a phone a phone. It's been just fine for me. Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, GPS, all that. This even supports Wi-Fi calling. So if you are on T-Mobile, for example, you can use that feature as well. No issues. If you have had any issues, let me know though. I'm always curious. So lastly, what I want to talk about in this review are these 12.3 megapixel cameras that we have on the back. Both of them are the same. This is the highest scoring DxO Mark camera that Google is calling the best camera on any smartphone. Now, I don't know about that, but I have played around with this quite a bit, and I do have some things to say. So looking a little bit at the specs, this is a 12.3 megapixel camera, f2.0 aperture lens. There's laser assist autofocus as well, and large 1.55 micron pixels, but no optical image stabilization, which is something that we've really come to expect. So in my time with playing with this, I find that the camera is definitely a point and shoot compared to a true photography tool. To point that further home, the onboard app is very simple. There are no pro features. All you've got for options here are the timer, the HDR plus option. Here's the option for the grid. You've got a little bit of white balance options and then also flash off, auto and on. You can tap around and mess with the exposure compensation, but that's it. Of course, you're free to load a third party application should you like. So I feel that this camera is a testament to what can be done with decent optics and post-processing with their HDR plus algorithm. It doesn't have optical image stabilization like I was talking about, or a really wide aperture like we've come to expect, like f1.8, f1.7. Though it does have very large pixels to help pull in light, but Google doesn't want you to care or focus on those factors. They don't want you to care how they are achieving their results, but just that the results are good. And they definitely are good, but I don't know if I would call them the best. First of all, an issue that I have seen is that we do get some weird lens flaring going on. They won't fix this hardware issue this time around, but they will try to take care of it with software. And looking at what they can do with HDR+, I definitely believe that they can succeed, at least minimizing that look of the lens flare. I do see a lot of potential, though. I like the color processing, for the most part. It really pops, so it doesn't look quite natural, but it does look really nice. I've really enjoyed the results. I think that there are plenty of details in the images, even though they're only 12.3 megapixels. And what's really nice is that Google doesn't overprocess the images and make fine details look really smudgy. I see that all the time. They also don't over sharpen their images either. Thank goodness. So in lower light environments, instead of going crazy with their noise reduction, they allow a fine grain to show through. And I love that. I will probably use this camera a lot because I really I can't stand over processing. And I think Google has done that right here. Now looking at how the camera deals with exposure, it can be often frustrating because touching on a different spot can totally change the exposure of the image. So sometimes I want certain parts of the image to be exposed properly and it will either blow them out or underexpose them. So I've had to get to know this camera very well so I know what to focus on so the scene will be <laughs> exposed properly. I recommend keeping HDR Plus on as much as possible to get a more stylized image. I find that it makes images look nicer in general though, especially when the high dynamic range aspect is needed. So that's a definite plus. Definitely keep it on in low light. I can't stress this enough. It seems that Google counts on the size of the pixels on the sensor and cranking up the ISO, then post-processing it later to make it look good. 
So definitely keep HDR Plus on for taking photos in low light. It actually does quite well in low light. Even without optical image stabilization, that surprised me. It does a pretty great job. So Google is able to show that you really don't need to have optical image stabilization. Not if you've got their crazy algorithms going on. What's nice about software algorithms is that they can change it and adapt it over time so it's not stuck like hardware. So moving on to macro focus, it has been okay. I can't get as close to my subjects as some other smartphone cameras and we don't get as a shallow depth of field, but you can use Google software to add some bokeh and I think that it works all right. I've gotten some decent results. It's not as cool as what's on the iPhone portrait mode though. Now when looking at video, unfortunately it records the audio in mono. Why do this, Google? Seriously. But I have been pretty astounded by the electronic image stabilization. Google has tied it to the gyroscope to make the images look less shaky, and holy cow does it work. It feels like I have the phone on a gimbal. It is that smooth. Also, it's awesome that we have the same stabilization on 4K footage too, so you can use the EIS on the 4K. I think that the quality of the images looks detailed and sharp to me. I like the colors. I think that it's a very capable video camera. And also to drive home the abilities here, it also seems that their autofocus is just the best in class. It's just so fast and so accurate. So overall, I love the camera as a simple point and shoot camera, thanks to Google's algorithms. But outside of those software abilities, it's just an okay camera. The images look okay without HDR+. But again, Google doesn't want you to worry about those details, just the results. So to wrap things up, both of these are great and